ready for that. Oh, I think they like me when they hurt me on the other one. So it's so only right that we hit you with another one. Oh, I think they like me when they hurt me on the other so it's so only right that I hit you with another one. What up guys, Ali here, and welcome to the channel. Now before I get started, I know you guys noticed that the name of the channel has changed. I changed it because when I first started the channel, it had no direction. I simply chose the first name that came to mind without realizing that there are other platforms out there with the same name. Don't worry, the content won't change much. Also add me on IG at Ali Talks Hip Hop. Let's get started. In the mid 2000s, Jermaine Dupri was on fire. He worked with artists such as Mariah Carey and Usher, contributing to a large number of their hits. Throughout his career, Jermaine Dupri has always kept his eyes out for new talent, and around 2006, he signed them franchise boys to So So Deaf. Before signing to the label, the group had humble beginnings. The group was born from the synergy of four boys who attended the same high school. One would not have expected much. They mostly did music for fun. It wasn't until they went off to college that they came together under the group name Damn Franchise Boys. They set out to push their group straight from the dorm room into the streets and eventually the country. According to Parley, the members of the group were homeboys and also business partners. And that's why they chose the name Damn Franchise Boys. By 2003, the group started releasing their own mixtapes with the hopes of being signed. Soon after releasing music for public consumption, its various record labels came knocking at their doors. At this point in their life, Damn Franchise Boys had a lot of options. A lot of labels wanted their attention, but after much consideration, they stuck with Universal Records. In no time, the group was ready to make moves, and they released their first official single titled, White Tea. This song became a regional smash and gained nationwide exposure when it was featured on BET. The song made a lot of noise for the group. It peaked at number 97 on the US Billboard Hot 100, and shortly after its release, it was accompanied by their self-named album titled Damn Franchise Boys. Interestingly enough, the group recorded White T in their dorm room back in college. As mentioned earlier, the group had no idea that the single would blow up. But when it did, it opened a lot of doors for the group of boys. Before we knew it, people were asking us for more music. Finally, we decided to drop out and move home and do this for real. Over the years, Damn Franchise Boys have seemingly disappeared from the public eye, leaving their fans wondering what happened to the group. What y'all been up to? I mean, you know, the same thing, man. Just working, man. Trying to maintain, keep the money flowing. Grinding? Grinding, man. Uh, Let's dig in and find out. Now around 2004, it was finally time for the group to release their debut album. They had the attention of the fans, and people were waiting to see what they would do next. Generally speaking, the album performed fairly. The album failed to reach the top 100 of the Billboard 200 and came in at number 106. Highlights of the project include Where I'm From, When Can We Date, That's The Way They Roll, Be Your Dance Girl, amongst others. Now the project's main genre was crunk, southern hip-hop, and the new snap movement that was the trend back then. As far as lyrics go, the project was very simplistic, however that was exactly what the group was going for. Now after their first album underperformed, Damn Franchise Boys had no choice but to keep working. And in no time, the group linked up with Jermaine Dupri of So So Def Recordings after he was appointed president of Virgin's Urban Division. We knew JD. We met JD through a car show in Dallas. You know, we had a song YT. When JD got on the YT remix, it got really popular. So we ended up doing a show with him in Dallas at the car show there. That was the first time meeting JD. And it was like, it was real responsive, real crazy. So JD was like, I want to do something else with y'all. So we had a song. Oh, I think they like me. And JD said, let's do an official remix. Put it on his Young Fly and Flashy album. And then a song turned into a contract. Real. But it's so crazy how that happened because that led to, oh, I think they like me. <laughs> because the success from White Tea, everybody started making in my green tea, in my pink, in my blue, yellow, all that shit. And then I think Gucci Man. He made the black tea. And our remix was gonna be black tea. And me personally, I took that shit hard. I took that shit like, oh, that fucked up. That same day, one of my homeboys walked up to me. He was just like, I'm in the truck. He's just like, hey, bro, you need to sample yourself saying, um, oh, I think they like me. But them hoes like that shit. That's what he tell me, just like that. And walk off. Like, like some, you know what I'm saying? Like, he was an angel or some shit. So I'm like, damn. Yeah, so I go up there, 
take that shit out the um the white tee, boom. I make the whole beat around that sound. How JD got 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 on it. It's so crazy because he had already did a remix to the white tee. After we did, oh, I think they liked me, started getting that buzz. He called me like, hey, I want to do a real remix. In the light of this nomination, one of his first acquisitions was Damn Franchise Boys. For a while, the fans were waiting to see what Damn Franchise Boys would do next, until the boys hit a major breakthrough and captured the hip-hop audience for three weeks back to back. In 2005, the group released a remix of Oh I Think They Like Me. When they played, played it the first time on the radio, we heard it for the first time. So I'm in the radio station like, oh shit, you got on it too? Oh, oh shit, the brat, oh, oh, nigga, my wall on that bitch. Nigga, I'm out, you feel what I'm saying? Like straight up, bro, like, oh, we out of the hill, so man. Originally, the song appeared on their debut album under the name, Oh, I Think They Like Me. It was renamed, I Think They Like Me, featuring Jermaine Dupri, The Brat, and Bow Wow. Preceding their second album, the remix of their original song was a huge success for the group. The single topped the hip-hop and R&B charts for three weeks and clinched the number 15 spot on the Billboard Hot 100. Internationally, the single did beautifully, coming at number 5 and number 27 in Finland and New Zealand, respectively. At this point in time, the Enfranchised Boys were at the top of their game. This major breakthrough paved the way and set the stage for their album, which was birthed in early 2006 and rightfully titled On Top of Our Game. After the single that preceded the album, they released yet another body of work, which blew up almost immediately. The album picked at number 5 on the Billboard 200 and sold about 106,000 copies in the first week. Due to the success of singles such as Lean With It Rock With It and I Think They Like Me, the Enfranchise Boys continued to rise in popularity and were finally making a name for themselves. Hey, hey, all I gotta do, all I gotta say is, man, thank you, JD, boy, straight up, boy, because JD, he put that battery in our back and, and took us out of here, boy, straight up. Now, in my opinion, the group was very polarizing. When Damn Franchise Boy started blowing up, people started to question whether their music was authentic and wondered if it deserved a place in hip hop. People started saying things like, what happened to bars? Is snap music or ringtone rap the new wave in hip hop? These are the type of questions that the group had to endure. As we all know by now, the East Coast is known for breeding some of the best MCs in the game. I'm talking about Biggie, DMX, Nas, and the list goes on. So it comes at no surprise that many rappers from the East Coast didn't respect ringtone rap. Unfazed by this point of view, Parley went on to say that nobody's checking for bars anymore. He also said that the South is the biggest thing in hip hop at the moment and even took a jab at Nas. Hip hop is a tool we use to avoid violence, gunplay, and everything else that comes with the streets. It's music, we're expressing ourselves, we're having fun. Nobody's trying to hear about ancient scriptures and shit. Niggas is trying to get with bitches. Go read a book if you're trying to get educated. It's always the over the hill rappers trying to get back in the game and this the hottest thing out, which right now is the South. It's a movement. This ain't 96. Nobody's checking for Nas anymore. Just because we don't live to a certain type of hip hop code that he does, we ain't hip hop. Evidently, them franchise boys didn't care about their detractors. As the year progressed, which was obviously looking good, the new snap music in the southern region of Atlanta started making waves, and them franchise boys became known as one of the leaders of the movement. As this style began to increase in notoriety, an unavoidable beef formed between them franchise boys and another group called D4L. Apparently, the Enfranchise Boys accused D4L of stealing their style and dance steps. At the time, D4L were the masterminds behind the number one most downloadable song in the country called Laffy Taffy. In light of the accusations, D4L didn't reply back until their manager, Johnny Cable, had an interview on BET and the opportunity presented itself to address the issue. It appears Johnny wasn't one to mince his words as he decided to go at them franchise boys directly. According to Johnny, them franchise boys were merely jealous of D4L's success and envied their position in the rap game. The beef between both groups became so petty that D4L once referred to them franchise boys as them franchise kids. Although fans perceived this as a beef, Pimpin commented later on the issue and revealed that it wasn't much of a beef because them franchise boys had no animosity towards D4L and D4L was merely jealous of them franchise boys. Interestingly enough, the competition between D4L and them franchise boys is still going strong to this day. Last year, Fabo of D4L and Parley of them franchise boys up down to Instagram Live and had a heated debate about who started the Snap movement. So, 
I seen the goddamn post on Jizzle page that said, who started snap music? All right? He said, Jizzle said, nigga sent it to him in his DM. So I got it, and I put it up. You feel me? So when the Yola jumped off, me and Yola hanging out, Yola take me way before all of this, or whatever, to Pippin. So if you want to know who started the snap movement, it was me and Pimpin sitting there at Allen Temple. You ain't even around. You ain't got nothing to do with it. So if you want to talk about who jumped off the snap movement, it was the money song. That was the first snap song, uh, song that set the movement anywhere. Nigga, the club, pool palace, singing the money song. This already, they tried. Now around 2008, the group finally came together to release their third studio album before going on a permanent hiatus. The album was called Our World, Our Way, and was recorded by Koch Records. Now unlike the group's second album, Our World, Our Way was a massive flop. The album made its way to number 115 on the US Billboard 200 and sales wise, it didn't perform very well. After the group's third album, things weren't looking good for the boys at all. And around this time, the group took a hiatus. Years after, during an interview, Pimpin explains what occurred. According to Pimpin, one of the reasons why the group broke up is because Parley decided to go solo, Parley decided to do his own thing, and this left the other members of the group feeling incomplete. After the third album, well, um, what happened, Pale, he decided to go solo because, um, you know, some things happened. I think Pale was shooting a movie. Or he was shooting The Trap, his movie. And, you know, the group, will, the group wasn't giving him his support. You know what I'm saying? The whole group. You know, basically, you know, when he asked me, it was like, shit, whatever you need me to do, bro, they give me the time and the date, I'm there. And it wasn't the same energy. And, you know, he fell back, you know, but we, we you know, we, we were still cool, but he fell back just from the whole the franchise, boy. Oh, uh, I'm bringing my set right now. Let me, everybody know, when you know, see Paul, you're going to know he's, he was a franchise boy, so he was a member in the franchise boys. So that name is there. It's already there. Niggas, niggas know that. I'm bringing Paul I am Paul Let Let niggas know me. How I kick, how I get, you know what I'm saying, how I get down, straight up. Pimpin' left the group as well. He felt like the group wasn't organized and didn't like how the group was handling their business. And after that, you know, me, Jill, and Buddy, we continued to, um, you know, we continued to tour. And it was like, with me, I'm the most business, you know, minded person. Like, I handle all the business and everything. And the way they was handling business on the road, you know, I, I didn't appreciate it. It was kind of making it. When you in a group, if one person do something, they ain't gonna say that one person, they gonna say, them franchise boys did this. And it was a whole bunch, a lot of bad stuff being said. And it was just like, man, if this continue, you know, shit, it ain't gonna be no group. Nobody ain't gonna wanna fuck with us. You know what I'm saying? So I made a decision like, man, I'm going to do my own thing. According to Pimpin, he was the most business-minded person in the group. He handled most of the things relating to business for the group. And after Parley left, the group decided to go on tour. While the group was on tour, there was a lot of animosity between the group members, leading to the group's demise. Pimpin went off to become a solo act afterwards. Around 2016, armed thugs ran up into the studio while Pimpin was there. According to reports, the men got past his security and aimed a weapon straight at Pimpin. In an act of bravery, Pimpin was able to disarm the shooter and chase his attackers out. Interestingly enough, the armed men weren't able to steal anything. Initially, Pimpin thought that his former group members might be behind the attack because a few days prior, they had a disagreement about money. At this time, Pimpin was cool with Parley because they had no real issues, but other members of the group weren't in a good space with Pimpin. After the attack, Pimpin reached out to Buddy to find out if he was involved in the attempted robbery. However, Buddy denied being any part of it. According to reports, the franchise boy's former manager was involved in the attempted robbery. And just when things looked like they couldn't get any worse, around 2019, one of the former members of the group lost his life to cancer. After a struggle with cancer, Buddy closed his eyes to the world. News of his death was announced by the members of the group. In honor of his memory, Parley and the other members of Dem Franchise Boys posted tributes of Buddy on the internet for the world to see. Parley, who was the closest to Buddy, posted a lengthy tribute for Buddy on Instagram alongside an old group picture. Also, Jermaine Dupree made sure to make a tribute to Buddy as well. Debrat followed suit, as well as a host of 
of others. Now one thing about hip hop groups is that the fans expect them to stick together no matter what. When one member of a group leaves and does something else, the group is usually not the same. Their music and image suffers and most times they eventually fall out of the limelight. With that being said, I don't think damn franchise boys can do much without Buddy. They can still tour and make club appearances, do interviews, but without Buddy, the group is missing an essential part of the group. The Enfranchise Boys get about 600,000 monthly listeners on Spotify and their most popular songs on the platform are Lean With It, Rock With It, I Think They Like Me, The Remix, and Turn Heads. You know what I'm saying? JD called me the last minute, I got down like, hey bro, pull up. I'm like, man, I'm at court, man. Court, man, I get you out of jail. So I got nothing this shit. And here we are today. These niggas on my suit too big. It was big, bro. Let the people, let man, let them see it, man. <laughs> Please, man. Oh, I already found it. Y'all ready for it? Oh my god. Y'all ready for this? He got that. Hey, like, Suge Knight. Hey, 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 I respect that. You did not wear a hat. Hey, Pimp, you know how funny this is? Only thing I went, only thing I went on, I went on Google. I typed in Pimpin' so so damn big suit, and they said what? That's it for me, man. It's your boy Ali. What happened to them franchise boys? In your opinion, let me know down below. If there's anything that I left out, be sure to let me know as well. Knew what happened to video dropping next week? Also, add me on Instagram. That's Ali Talks Music, and yeah, peace.